Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I did catch more fish than him. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. No, we had a good time. It's good to be back. It was well needed <laughs> for on our side. Fish didn't like it so much, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. But it's good to be here. You know, and, you know we were singing the songs this morning and talking about <laughs> the devil's had us bound too long. And, you know, he lies to us. We, I got one word for him. Blood! <laughs> Blood! The blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. Oh, he hates it. But thank God for the blood. Are you thankful for the blood? Where would you be without the blood of Jesus this morning? Oh, hallelujah. I know where I would be. I would be in a devil's hell this morning if it wasn't for the blood of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. That ought to stir you up. That gives you some ammunition. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And you know, most of the time we say you better strap in this morning, but I'm telling you to not strap in. Don't put your seatbelts on. I don't want you buckled down. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I don't want you buckled down. I want you responding to the Holy Spirit this morning. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to put your uh, steel toe boots on either. You can take them off. I'm going to break some bones this morning. <laughs> that the bones which God breaks, they may rejoice. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You just take them off. I'm going to preach a message this morning on a true heart of repentance. A true heart of repentance. And if you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9. Everybody there? He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed, boy, I feel this, that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Oh, hallelujah. But the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, listen to this, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yes, what clearing of yourselves. Yes, what indignation. Yes, what fear. Yes, what vehement desire. Yes, what zeal. Yes, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Heavenly Father, we just thank You, Lord God, for the precious blood of the Lamb of God. We thank You, Lord God, that has been applied to our hearts, Father God, by faith. We just thank You for Your grace and for Your mercy this morning. We thank You for Your Word this morning, Lord God, for Your Word is truth, Lord God. And we pray, Lord God, that You would touch our hearts this morning, Lord God. That the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, would lay upon us, Lord God, with the weightiness of Your righteousness, Father God. That it might lead us unto repentance, Father God. For we are in so much need of repentance, Lord God, in our own lives, in our church, Lord God, and in this land, Lord God, and in the world, Lord God, today. And we're asking You today, Lord God, to let it begin in us, Lord God. That You would break our hearts, Father God. That You would break our spirit, Lord God. That we may, Lord God, sorrow after a godly sort, Lord God, this morning, Lord God. That leads us, Lord God, to a place of repentance, Lord God. 
For we are clear, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray that you would have your way, Lord God. And we give you glory. And we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. You strapped yourself in. I heard the clicks go on. (laughs) As we begin in our endeavor, if you will, to study the Word of God, and in particular, the message of the cross. And the thing about the message of the cross It is just the Word of the cross. It is the preaching of the cross. It's the message of the cross. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That and that alone is what it means. But as we endeavor to study it and understand how we live for God by faith and how we have victory over sin, sometimes we get this mindset in the body of Christ that we can just do whatever we want without any consequence to our sin. That we can just continue in sin that grace may abound. That we can just continue to do whatever we want and we can just look to God's forgiveness later on. Because you know, after all, He will forgive you of your sin because He loves you. And so we just continue to engage in our sinful activity and just ask God to forgive us of our sin. Even though in our hearts we have no intention whatsoever on turning. We're just going to continue trusting in this grace of God. That it may abound over my sin. Because after all, that's what God's grace does. It covers your sin. But i got news for you today. God's grace will not abound over your sin if your attitude towards sin is not His attitude towards sin. We begin to think that since there's nothing that I can do about sin in my life, I can just continue to do it and just wait for God to take it out of my heart. I mean, although that's what God does, take sin out of the heart, that's not the way He does it. Oh, that's not the way God takes sin out of the heart. As we just sit back on our blessed assurance and we just continue in sin waiting for Him to do it. See, we have a misunderstanding of the message of the cross. We hear the message of the cross being preached. We hear the preachers. We hear the teachers. And they say that we can't defeat sin in our own power and our own ability. And we begin to think that since we can't defeat sin, that I'll just sit back and just continue to do it until God takes it out of the heart. See, honey, that ain't faith. God works through faith. Not presumption. That He is going to allow you to continue in sin that His grace that He shed on Calvary's cross may abound over your indifference towards sin. See, there's something that you can do about sin. There is something that you are expected to do about sin. There is something that God demands of you about sin. And that is to believe Him for it. To believe that He takes it out of your heart. That's what you're expected to do. That's your responsibility. It's not only something that you are expected to do. It's your reasonable service. You have a reasonable service to this God that bled and died for your sin. How can we continue to do the thing that He bled and died for to forgive you of so you can keep on doing it? Hmm. See, we have a responsibility to believe God, to take it out of the heart, take up what Christ did on Calvary, the benefit of Calvary, the, the, the power that He destroyed through His victory over sin, that power that sin had over us, when that old man was crucified with Him upon believing faith, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, there was something that was accomplished there. And we are to believe that, what happened there. It was for us. It was in the atonement that we have freedom from sin. And it's our responsibility, I beseech you therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable to you because God did the work. He's not asking you to do something that is beyond your ability because your ability is to believe. That is what we are to do. Believe God for the victory. Not just sit back and let Him take it out of the heart. Because that ain't the way He works. How did you get saved? You had to come to a place where you couldn't do it. You had to come to a place where you repentant in your heart. And God's grace was provided to you upon believing faith. You had to believe something to get it done. Even though the work was done 2,000 years ago. It was done. But you got to believe it to receive it. You don't sit back and say, because God died 2,000 years ago, well, I'm saved. Well, let me tell you something. If you have not come to a place where you understand that you are in need of a Savior, that you are on your way to a devil's hell, and that you need to repent, that you have sinned against God, until you come to that place where you are repentant in your heart. You ask God to forgive you. Now, upon believing faith, grace is supplied. Amen. Not sitting back waiting for that. Uh -uh. You had a responsibility to respond to the Holy Spirit. You had a responsibility to believe Him. And when you did, you received salvation. That's what happened. You took up the cross. You took up what Christ did on Calvary to save you. And now that you are saved, He says, present your body. Why? Because it is your body that is neutral. It is your body that the sin nature works through. And it is your body through which the divine nature will work through and bring forth fruit unto death or bring forth fruit unto life, unto righteousness. So it is your body that is neutral. There's not unrighteous members of your body. It's all neutral. There's not righteous members of your body. It is all the same. It is neutral. It will, it will, the Holy Spirit will operate through you in the members of your body. That's what He does to bring forth fruit unto God. To bring forth fruit of righteousness unto God. Holiness. Holy and acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. So when we say that there's nothing that you can do to defeat the power of sin, we're talking about in your ability, in your flesh, in your efforts, by your own will and desire to overcome it. That's what we're talking about. We're not saying that you just sit back. And you just continue in sin because you can't defeat it. We're saying that it's your responsibility to exhibit faith. It's your responsibility to, to express faith in the finished work of Calvary's cross that you may have victory in your life. That's your responsibility. That's what you're supposed to do. To believe God. You have that responsibility to do so. And as you look to Calvary and what was accomplished there, and you yield yourself unto God, the members of your body, boy, I feel you yield the members of your body to work through, to operate through. Grace does not give you the freedom to sin. Grace gives you the freedom from the power of sin. That is what it's for. That's what grace is about. It's not about that you continue in sin so my grace can abound over your sin. Whenever your attitude toward it, having no desire to quit, I'll just wait, sit back, and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and wait for God to take it out of your heart. God's grace will not abound over your sin when you're not repentant in your heart. Mm, boy, it got awful quiet up in here. His grace will not abound over your sin if you do not express faith. If you do not exhibit faith in the one who defeated it. Because you can't defeat it. It took Christ coming in the flesh 
God coming in the flesh to defeat the power of sin. Because man had no ability to do so. Because of sin, his body was rendered incapable of doing so. So we look to Calvary. He's the one who defeated it. Where it was defeated. When He destroyed the power of sin through the shedding of His precious blood for the forgiveness of sins to redeem us from the law because He kept it in totality and in perfection. Taking the law out of the way. Nailed it to His cross. Hallelujah. And He's given us victory that way. His grace does not abound in our lives. Whenever we don't exhibit faith. <laughs> it takes grace and faith. Faith and grace. You can't live for God and live in your sin at the same time. I know this is unpopular in the world today. But I don't really give a rip. It's what thus saith the Lord. You can't you can't live for God in your sin. You can't love God and love your sin at the same time. One or the other has to go. Mm. One or the other has to go. You can't serve two masters. There's a question that says, what will you give in exchange for your soul? What will you give up for eternal life. What sin, what pleasure will you hold on to that's worth eternal hell? That was not created for you, but created for the devil and his angels and all them that follow him. It's not created for you. Hmm. But what will you give up? What will you give in exchange for that? Is the sin that you're engaged in, is it worth it? I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't really believe in God. Oh, really? You're a gambler and you didn't even know it. That's the biggest gamble in life. Are you willing to bet your eternal soul on it? Because I guarantee you, everybody that's in hell today, there's no atheist there today. Are you willing to go that far? Are you willing to lay down your eternal soul and say, I don't believe that there's a God? Because you one day, you will wake up and you will face Him. You will face Him at the white throne judgment seat or you will face Him at the judgment seat of the Christ. But one way or another, you're going to face Him. Are you willing to give up your eternal life? Because you don't think there's a God. Sister Stephanie, is there a God? Oh, hallelujah. Sister Autumn, where is she? Is she over there? I know she knows there's a God. Oh, hallelujah. I know that there's a God. Oh, hallelujah. I know what He's done in my life. I know how He's healed. I know how He's filled. I know how He's saved. I know how He has delivered. Are you willing to take that bet? You're playing a game with the devil and he is going to win. Are you willing to? So you can't serve God and yourself at the same time. If you're having trouble in your relationship with the Lord, and you've grown cold and indifferent in your heart, if you've grown apathetic and lethargic and complacent toward the things of God and toward, toward God and toward sin, and the Spirit of God can't move in your heart anymore, you don't feel His presence anymore, And you don't feel Him like you used to. And there's something wrong in your heart. There's something wrong in your life and it's causing that. And I'm not talking about a dry spell. Because we all go through dry spells. I'm talking about when you sit before the Lord and there's something that comes up before you and the Lord that He wants you to deal with. But you can't. Because you don't want to give it up. You don't, you don't have a heart toward, of repentance toward that thing. And God says that your sins and your iniquities have separated you between me and yourself. Uh -huh. My, 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 my. 
The Bible says that it's because of iniquity abounding that the love of many will grow cold. It's because of iniquity. And it's not just other things in this world, but it's sin. Uh, if your heart condemns you when you lay before the Lord and you feel the condemnation that is there because that thing that has popped up in your mind that you know is there that is between you and the Lord and your heart is condemning you know you're not that God is greater than your heart and He knows those things that are in your heart He knows what's already there and He wants you to be honest with Him. And He wants you to be honest with yourself. And He wants you to confess that thing. To get it under the blood. To nail it to the cross. To take care of it once and for all. So that it no longer has dominion over you. And let that blood cleanse you. Let that blood wash you. Let's take care of it today. Today is the day. If you'll harden not your heart, but if you'll hear the voice of God, don't harden your heart toward the Holy Spirit. But He wants to heal you today. He wants to free you today. If you will take heed to His voice. And don't be fearful. Don't be scared of God. God's not here to harm. God's not here to hurt. God is here to heal, to comfort, to save, and to deliver. He wants to give you... Uh, an expected him, a future, a life worth living in this world. He doesn't convict us of sin to condemn us and push us down. He convicts us so we respond to it, so he can wash it, so he can cleanse it, so he can get it under the blood, so you can be healed, so you can be free. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit is not something to be scared of. It's for you. It's for our benefit. He loves us so much. Oh my, 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 my. If our hearts condemn us, is there something that's in your life today that's condemning you? Do you feel any freedom with God when you sit before Him? Do you feel His presence? Do you feel He loves you? Or is there something that is gnawing at you? Something that is eating at you? Something that you've got to take care of that you want to take care of? And He's drawing you. And He's pleading with you. And He wants you to come unto Him so that He can heal you. Hallelujah. But if we refuse to repent, then our relationship with God will be will suffer greatly and not just our relationship with God but our relationship with everybody around us it suffers greatly and i must say you're not going to go any further than your last act of disobedience you won't go any further when god has dealt with you and dealt with you and dealt with you and you continue to refuse and refuse and refuse to come unto Him, you will not go any further than that. You'll go around the mountain again and again and again. And say, God's good. He brings us to a place of repentance. I don't pray for people to have, you know, they say pray for my family, they're away from God. I don't know if you really want me to pray for I pray for trouble all up in their lives. <laughs> well, that's kind of me. No, 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 no. See, without trouble, you don't know your need for God. You just sit back in your, in your safety and don't know that you're on your way to a devil's hell. So I say, trouble them, Lord. Stir it up. Don't let nothing happen good. Oh. <laughs> Because without it, you won't reach out to God. Hey, God, wait, I waited patiently for the Lord. And He heard my prayer. Oh, hallelujah. He pulled me out of that horrible pit. And out of that miry clay. See, it takes you getting down in the miry clay. And in that horrible pit. Until He can pull you out. Because He heard your cry. He heard your prayer. Oh, hallelujah.
It's like Pastor Jim said, the devil wants to steal your confidence. Turn with me, if you would, real quick to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. He says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. When you sit before the Lord, is there confidence with your God? That He hears your prayer? That His ears are open unto you? Or does it feel like His ears are closed to your prayer? Because you know that He knows all things. And if there is sin in our lives, He won't hear us. Boy, that probably goes against all the theology today. We can just live in our sin all we want and God hears your prayer. Oh, hallelujah. I got news for you. He wants to hear one prayer. And that's a prayer of repentance. That's what He wants to hear. That prayer that is from a broken heart. Mm. He already knows what's there. He already knows. He just wants you to be honest with yourself. He wants you to stop lying to yourself. He wants you to stop lying and deceiving your own self. But hear Him talk to you. Hear Him touch your heart to convict you of sin so He can wash you clean so He can put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what He wants. To cleanse it. To wash it away. There has to be repentance. Repentance of sin a Christian will die in his faith he will die spiritually if he continues to play around with sin if he continues to play around in sinful activity and that is the absolute truth God's grace will be given to you in a certain degree in a certain measure if you play around with sin and if you think that you're okay in doing that, and that God is okay with you doing that, and you're okay with God, then you're deceiving yourself. Hmm. See, the thief comes not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. He's looking to destroy you. Sin will corrupt your faith. In God. That is how He does it. The corruption of faith. If you don't have any confidence toward your God, your faith is being corrupted by sin. And if you don't take care of it sooner or later, you'll continue to go down this road, down this path, where this sin becomes easier. Where this sin becomes more frequent. And where sin begins to grow and then it'll be one sin and another 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 sin. And you will become complacent. You will become lethargic. You'll, you, won't, you won't feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit laying upon you at all because your faith is dying and you're dying spiritually to God because the lamp of God is going out in your heart. Sin is destroying you. And the more sin abounds in your life, the effect of sin is deadened. You become desensitized to it. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit will become deadened. And sin will lead you into presumption because you have become insensitive or desensitized to sin. It will destroy your consecration unto the Lord where you compromise with the world and the things of the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life you love the things of this world more than you love the things of God oh hallelujah mm. you'll walk away from God because of sin 
Sin doesn't touch us anymore. In the church. Sin doesn't affect us anymore. Where's the broken hearts over sin? Where's the brokenness and the contrite heart? Where's the contrition over sin in the church today? No, we just want sin. Whatever sin, it doesn't matter. Ordaining homosexuals as pastors. We just want our sin. We don't want to change. We just want God to change for us. Because we are lovers of pleasure and we want our sin. And we don't want to repent of our sin. We don't want to call sin, sin. But there has to be a true heart of repentance in the church today. And I think the reason why we don't fear or we don't have a brokenness over sin is because we don't fear God. We're just sitting back in the lap of luxury. We're just sitting back in the lap of grace. There's no, there's no fear of the righteousness of God. All this talk about love, 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 love. God loves everyone in hell today. But His righteousness could not be overlooked on their part. His righteousness, He will not circumvent His righteousness. Oh my, my, my. Sin violates the righteousness of God. And we don't fear God. See, if we're not bothered by sin, there's something wrong. If we're not troubled in our hearts towards sin, there's something wrong with us. If we're not seeking with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength to be delivered from the sin, then there's something wrong with us. We just got this ho-hum attitude toward it. Oh, it's no big deal. God will forgive me. We don't grieve over it. We don't mourn over it. We don't howl and weep over it. Over our own. I'm not preaching just you. I'm preaching to myself. You understand? This ain't Jesus up here. Mm. We don't grieve. We've forgotten what sins we have been forgiven of. We have forgotten the price that was paid. We have no regard for it. We have no respect unto it. We don't look at it as closely as we should. Like Pastor Jim said, look in my face. Oh my, my, my. That veil was torn. The door swung wide. And now I can come in and bow down in the very presence of God because of the price that was paid. Never let Yourself forget the price that was paid because we can be, we can become lethargic to it. We can come, become complacent to it because we're just going about our natural day, taking care of our business. We don't look at Calvary. We don't look at the price that was paid. We don't look at Jesus Christ the way we should. We don't look at the price that He paid and the sufferings that He went through. We just ignore it. Now we know about it. But we don't give attention to it. We don't. We become unthankful, ungrateful. Sport little children. Mm. But we have forgotten the price that was paid for our sin. Oh, hallelujah! Our indifference toward it. The awfulness of sin. See, it's because we have a misunderstanding of grace. We look at it as though He's just going to take care of it because we are children of God. He's not going to do that if your attitude toward it is not His attitude toward it. If you're just playing with sin, thinking that God's just going to forgive you because after you're all, you're a child of God. See, we forgot, we don't know what grace is about. We don't understand it. 
And not only that, we don't understand what repentance is. We don't really truly understand repentance. It's not saying, God, forgive me of my sin. It's not what it is. Because you can ask God to forgive you of your sin, and in your heart, you have no intentions on turning. You just don't want to deal with the consequences of it. Oh my, 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 my. You don't want to turn from it in your heart. You got to have a true heart that is broken and moved to grief over sin after a godly sort. Not the selfishness of the worldly sort where you got caught and you don't want to face the consequences of sin. You know, when you were out in the world, <laughs> I remember... Oh my God, every time I got pulled over, I was either drunk or high or something like that. Oh God, keep me out of jail. Here we go, start making deals with God. God, if you get me out of this, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you. If you get me out of this, I'll go to church. If you get me out of this, I... I, I. Worldly sorrow. It leads unto death because there's no repentance of sin and the wages of sin is death. It's worldly sorrow that is not working unto life. Unto repentance that leads to life everlasting. It is a worldly sorrow. Uh, some of y'all remember the movie uh, with Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. The end, that showed the end. Uh, yeah, he had, had a couple of months to live and so he tried to keep on killing himself. <laughs> and he goes to this a uh, mental institution where Dom DeLuise was happy to oblige him. And he was trying to kill him around every corner, doing whatever he could, push him off a cliff, hanging, whatever. He was trying to help the brother out. At the end of the movie, old Burt Reynolds swimming out in the middle of the lake. He's going to go there, he's going to drown himself. He goes out in the middle of the lake, and he goes down. And he's down there for just a little while. And he comes popping back up. Oh God, forgive me. Oh God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And he starts swimming back to shore. He's like, Lord, if you let me make it to shore, he's way out there. If you make it, let me make it back, I'll give you 10% of everything that I earn. And by the time he got 100 yards from the shore, yeah, I know I started with 10%, but well, let's start off with five. And see, that's the way we do with God. We begin to make deals with God. That if you get me out of this trouble then I will serve you. No, 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 no. You come to God on His own terms. You come to God the way He wants you to, just as you are. No deal making, because I've already de destroyed sin for you. I've already made the provision for you. Just believe me. Don't make any deals with me. I'm not here to hurt you or to harm you. I'm here to help you up. I'm here to give you a future. I'm here to heal you. I'm here to deliver you. That's what I don't make no deals with. Come right to me, just as you are. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. You know, you'd be doing those drugs and you do an overdose, you know, and you're like, God, I don't want to die. God save me. I don't want to die. And as soon as you figure out that you're not dead, you go back for another shot. You go back for another line. You go back for another hit. You go back for another. See, that's worldly sorrow. You're sorry that you got caught. You're sorry that you're about to die and go to a devil's hell. But you're not repentant in your heart to turn from it. Oh, I'm preaching better than you, Sean. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my, my. That's what we do with God, though. We just make deals with Him. He doesn't want us to make deals with Him. Oh my gosh. Godly sorrow that works repentance. A heart that is broken. A heart that grieves. A heart that is turning from sin. I remember when I gave my life to the Lord back in August 1997. And my little sister came up to visit me for my birthday. 
I had no intentions on going to church. It was the farthest thing from my mind. I didn't care. My little sister was going to go back to Texas Saturday night about 2 o'clock in the morning unless I went to church with her in the morning. I said, okay, I'll go to church. You know, <laughs> arrogance. <laughs> okay, I'll go to church. But thank God I went to a church where the convicting power of the Holy Spirit was there. And I don't remember what was preached. I just know that the Spirit of God was there. And as soon as I walked in the doors, man, I was crying like a little stinking scoundrel that I was in the presence of God. Because the presence of God was there. And I felt it. And at the end of that service, and he called the altar call. I was the only one to walk down that aisle. I don't know how many people. There's 300 people there. I was the only one to walk down that aisle from the very back to the front. I was squirming the whole time trying to get out of there. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. See, we get fearful of God. We don't have to be fearful. That conviction there is for healing. And I was squirming for no reason just because I knew I'm your scout. You've got to ask for forgiveness. You've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to come to a place well, you're repentant of sin. And I came to that place. I walked down that altar and I knelt on my, on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know who you are, but I want to know you. I have done my own thing my whole life the way I have wanted to. I've done whatever I wanted to with whoever I wanted to as long as I wanted to. But today, if you'll forgive me of my sin, if you'll come into my heart and cleanse me of all unrighteousness, I'll give my life to you. As long as you teach me who you are, show me who you are, and help me to know you, I'll serve you all the days of my life. And I came up from that prayer a brand new creation. I came up from that prayer saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through a heart of repentance, I had no intentions on turning before I got there. But when I got there, and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit laid upon me in my heart, oh God, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't want to do what I'm doing anymore. I had a heart of repentance. I was broken over my sin. I was broken. <laughs> that is where God wants us. That is where God wants the church today. He doesn't want us to continue going down the same direction that we're going. He wants us to have a godly sorrow to understand that it's against God that we have sinned and against God alone that we have sinned and done this evil in His eyes. It is not a sorrow unto death that is selfish and self-centered because I don't want to deal with the consequences. Is that I understand that I have sinned against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your eyes and in your sight. See, that is the sacrifices of God that He accepts. Not the sacrifices of just coming to church, going in, going out the same way we do every Sunday, every Wednesday. He wants the sacrifices of God that are of a broken heart, of a broken and contrite spirit. Those He will not despise. Oh, hallelujah. And that's what the church is missing today. See, even us in the, in the church today that are saved, born again, spirit-filled, walking with the Lord, learning the message of the cross, sometimes we think that we can just play around with sin. We can just play patty cake, patty cake, baker's man with the devil and think that we're going to be okay, that you can control it, that you can have enough control over it that's not going to affect you, that you can do a little bit here and a little bit there, and it's no big deal, that you won't get intertwined in it, that it won't be twisted up in you. And you can just play around and devil in it. 
Let me tell you something. You're playing with the devil who made the rules of the game. <laughs> you ain't going to win. You're going to become entangled in a bondage that you can't get free from, no matter how hard you try. It's a bondage. It becomes a stronghold that you can't let loose of. It's like Pastor Jim said. It's like a 220 or live wire. You grab hold of it and you can't let go. Because it's got a hold of you. And you got a hold of it. And it'll kill you. Hallelujah. See, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. See, this is what I'm talking about. The regarding of sin. The approval of it. The acceptance of it. The desiring, wanting it. If you regard it, that you won't get rid of it. If you have no earnest desire to be free from that thing. God won't hear your prayer. He wants you to be honest with Him. Because He already knows. He's trying to do something in your life. Mm. And that's why I say God's grace won't abound over it. Over your sin. That's why. It's because you're loving it. You want it. You desire it. More than you Love God more than you want Him. Oh, you love Him, but just not quite enough. There's not quite enough to get rid of that. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Is that man or that woman or that sin? That boy, that girl, whatever it is. Is it worth going to hell over? You gotta love me. I'm preaching the truth. See, if we continue down that road, all the protections and the blessings that you have enjoyed, they will begin to leave. And the presence of God that was in your heart and in your life before, it will begin to diminish. Because the light, the lamp is going out until it's completely gone out. Because we continue to go down that road. Continue to mess around with sin. Continue to go down the direction that we're going. Oh my, my, my. A lot of times we hear, and I, I've heard it for years. Where is the revival? Where is revival? Is God having a hard time Sending revival? Does he not know how to do it? Is he having trouble? We've been saying it for years. Where's it at? How come it won't come? It's because there's no repentance. There's no repentance in the house of God. There's no repentance. We just continue going and doing the same thing and thinking God is accepting of it. We just keep preaching the apost apostasy and heresy. We keep preaching, ordaining homosexuals. We keep doing these things that are against the Word of God. And we think that God's going to send a revival to a people that are arrogant and prideful and unrepentant in their hearts and God's just going to waste His moving of His Spirit upon a disobedient church. God is good all the time. It's not Him that's got a problem. It's the church that has the problem. It is because there's no repentance in the house of God. And if the level of repentance would begin in you, there would be a level of revival that comes to you. Because with the same level of repentance comes the same level of revival. 
God wants to revive His church. He wants us strong and powerful. He wants us preaching the same thing like Brother Tom said. Preaching the same thing. The unity of the faith. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. But there has to be repentance. I said at the beginning of the year with this coronavirus that God was trying to get His church's attention to bring us to a place of repentance, to give us, bring us to a place of, of prayer, of laying upon our face. And until then, until we get serious with God, it was going to continue. Boy, it has, hasn't it? Oh, that was prophetic. But we have to come to a place as a church that we are repentant in our heart. Musicians and singers, would you make your way back, please? See, you might be here today and your life is wrecked and your life is ruined. There's no way that you can fix your life. Your life is in a mess. You can't do anything about it. But I'm here to tell you today that if you would simply just trust the Lord, put your faith in Him, be honest with Him, trust Him, ask Him to forgive you of your sin with a true heart of repentance, with a true heart that is ready to turn from sin. That's what He desires. That's what He wants of His church today. I want to read this to you. This is the kind of repentance that works life. And I say works life, this is what happens. It creates a carefulness in you, in your heart, to utterly remove the sin in your life. That's the carefulness. With all diligence, the thing that you know about, the thing that you're thinking about right now, there is a carefulness there. To have that taken out of the heart with your uttermost diligence. It must be done. There's a haste there. I've got to do it with a speedy effort today. I've got to get it under the blood. I've got to nail it to the cross today. There is a clearing of yourself there. Because you take the blame. You take the culpability of the sin. You take full responsibility yourself in the wrongdoing and the direction that you have gone. There is indignation, a decided hatred of the sin that you engage in. A deep hatred for it because you view it as God views it. Because you see what it costs God. What fear it produces in the heart. A fear of God because you see the awfulness of it. <laughs> because you see the danger of its presence in your life the destruction that it causes because of the price that was paid there's a fear for it it says what a vehement desire there is an eagerness to get the thing straight there's an eagerness to get the thing right today to have revival in my heart oh I feel that what I want today to be revived unto God. What zeal that it causes. An earnest desire to get it done. To thoroughly be purged of it. Leaving no doubt. What revenge in you. A determination to right the wrong. It's a great displeasure against the sin. Against the wrong. And you don't want nothing to do with it anymore. That is what true repentance causes in the heart. Stand to your feet, please. I, I'm calling for people today. Yes, just to come forward. You know what I'm calling for. Just come on. Just come down here. If there's sin in your life, if there's things in your life that you want to take care of today, that you want to get under the blood, today's the day. Let's make it right with God today. 
Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Oh, Sister Linda, Sister Linda. Oh, la 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 Leader to the Lord. Oh, la 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 Oh God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our sins. Oh God. Oh, some things under the blood this morning we got some things taken care of this morning we got some things nailed to the cross this morning oh hallelujah and we got a sister restored in Jesus name oh hallelujah this is sister Trish y'all be sure and love on her today Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy today. We thank you for the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed, Lord God, for the forgiveness of our sins. For redeeming us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that we are purchased possessions of you, Lord. We ask you today, Lord God, that you would protect us as we go out. That you, Lord God, would touch us, that you would bless us, that you would strengthen our faith in you, Lord God. I pray that you bring us back on that appointed day, Lord God, full of the praises of God in our mouth, full of the worship of God in our hearts, Lord God, ready, Lord God, to worship you, ready to have a move of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, and we give you praise and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, and the church says amen. amen. Well, don't you